Hey, Lucas. Why, hello there. <laughs> <laughs> How are you today, Lucas? I am doing very good. It's great to be here. Oh, good. <laughs> Oh, we, we were just talking about how intros are awkward. So I'm glad that you like. Just get that out of the way. Let's just do it. All yep. the awkwardness right out of the way. And, I love uh, it. Now we can just be ourselves. So. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I do have a question though, because I like to start with a question. And sure. I think it's always good. I don't know. Like, I just want to do positive questions because let's face it. Like, there's just a lot of not positive things going on around us. But like, what are things that make Lucas Rubelke smile? What are things that just, you think about him and you're just happy? Um, well, that is a good question. Uh, not for a lack of a, a, a data set to pull from. Um, I think there's a, a lot of things that make me happy. The... And I'm going to try not to go down this rabbit hole. This is, I haven't rehearsed this. This is, um, <laughs> uh, this is extemporaneous off the top of my head. Um, one of my favorite concepts is this idea of cross-domain pollination. And um, it's, it comes from this idea of one of my favorite books is Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. And he talks about domain specificity where you kind of get blinded by the application of a specific like concept within a domain, you don't see how it could be applied in, in other domains. And so this is where I kind of coined this phrase, uh, cross-domain pollination, um, which just a book recommendation, and I will probably do this a lot. Um, there's a book called Range, and it's one of my absolute favorite books. And uh, he actually talks about this in a very masterful way. But the idea is of taking a concept from one domain and cross-pollinating or applying it into another domain. Okay. Um, and so the thing that I've really been into lately is looking for some of these meta patterns in like maybe one domain and trying to figure out how to apply it in unique and novel ways in other domains. So uh, what I've actually been in my personal time I've been studying is um, I've been reading up on a lot of calculus and, you know, calculus is interesting because it talks about, you know, really kind of the rate of change in derivatives and then how you can actually like composite things together to, or break things down into small problems. So okay. as I'm talking about this, am I talking about programming or calculus is that you take a hard problem, you break it down into very small problems, mm -hmm. solve them, and then you put that uh, you know, back together and which is integral math. And I'm just glossing over like these concepts a ton. Yeah. But as I read and I'm studying, you know, these concepts of, of calculus, which you can actually buy these illustrated comic books on Amazon um, and, you know, really thinking about the, the principles of, of calculus and how it describes the world around us, which is what we do as programmers yeah. and the, you know, even functional programming has its roots in, you know, functional math. And, and so I see a lot of overlap and kind of making those connections um, is, I think, really extremely gratifying. I've been playing uh, the piano pretty intently and with intention for the last two years. And um, I think the approach that somebody would take for learning an instrument and learning music is there's a lot of overlaps to how somebody would approach programming because okay. you could learn, for instance, a just a song, like I'm gonna show you how to play these notes in this order. So I think a, like a classic example, one of the first, I think the hello world of piano songs is like heart and soul. Like everybody's like, you know, they're playing that, you know, da, 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 da. And like everybody knows heart and soul and you can learn that and actually have no understanding of like why that works. And, you know, you don't realize, Oh, well, I'm doing the one, the six, the four and the five, you know, in this, you know, within this whatever yeah. key I'm in, Yeah. but you can learn it without understanding what's happening. But then even deeper is you understand like maybe the theory behind this harmonic motion. Um, I think this is the way with programming is that, you know, somebody can learn a framework, like let's say like angular, you can just use the CLI and, 
you know, generate stuff, but not actually understand, you know, why certain things are important, like component driven architecture, or even, you know, state management, unidirectional data flow. Right. And so I think, and I probably will talk about this more in a little bit, but seeing kind of these unifying themes across, you know, various forms of expression and disciplines and realizing that a lot of the same processes, though maybe the words are a little bit different, the semantics are right, different, right. that it, it really, I think, reinforces kind of this higher level um, kind of meta approach to, to skill acquisition and, and mm-hmm. learning. So hopefully that made sense, but um, it did. meta patterns are, are really exciting to me right now. I, I totally love that answer too, because I was expect like, if I had been asked that, I would have said like, ice cream, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like well, I mean, really I, simple. I'm doing, but, I'm doing keto right now. So I guess there is keto ice cream, which <laughs> makes me very happy. So there you go. Uh, there you go. I, I love that. No, but, but like, I love what you're saying and I actually do get it. And if, if anybody hasn't seen the episode with Adi, uh, no, like he actually says something very similar. And so that's why I'm, I'm loving your answer because right. he said, when you're teaching somebody new concepts, people often feel overwhelmed with like, oh my gosh, this is such heavy stuff and I'm not getting it. But he said, but they do know it. You just have to teach it in a way that they've heard it before. So, you know, use metaphors, use things that Mm -hmm. they're more familiar with. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I do get this. So I get, I think I get what you're saying and I agree. And, And I do also like when things like, just that like, how life kind of plays together. And when you're doing one thing like over here and then in an unrelated part of your life, it seems like that same topic or subject comes up and it all just sort of like interweaves together. Right. So yeah. It means you're doing things right. And it's always a good feeling. So I, hear I believe you. so. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. And so you've kind of alluded a little bit how we're going to get into this discussion and really, I'm really excited to have you here because and this is like story time, everybody. The first time really that we met in person, we'd kind of spoken a little bit like through Zoom or I don't even remember exactly. But the first time we met in person was in Arizona. I was with Joe Eames and we were there doing work for Thinkster.io. That that, that was the time when I was working there. And we had gone to Lucas because at the time you had a great consulting company and you were helping Thinkster to kind of launch our ideas and stuff and just get organized. And I just remember getting there and we were at your, your office. It was this great space. Mm -hmm. It had multiple rooms, but one thing that really stood out to me was how you had like this designated space for working with junior developers. And it was like a little dev shop of sorts. And for sure, I loved it, but like, that to me, when I think of Lucas now, that's one of the things that comes to mind is how you just, even though you had a business to be running and all of these other things to do, you still made time to take individuals and give them your time to train them and mentor them along and help them learn how to be developers. And so that, like, it just, when I thought of who would I want to have on an episode where we're talking about teaching people Angular, you know, with an emphasis on like junior and entry level developers, you instantly came to mind. So yeah, you have a great passion. I'm excited to get into it. As always, though, I want to play a game with you first. It's like, it's like oh, right, no. rite of passage. You have to get through the challenge first. <laughs> All right. The, the gatekeeper awaits. Yes. Yes. And for anybody that doesn't know Lucas, he likes to sing. As he mentioned, he plays <clears throat> piano. He's very musically talented. And we're going to play a little, I'm calling it Angular Anthems okay. because it's sort of musical. But I just played this game in a similar way with Dave Shevitz. If you remember okay. Dave, he you know did the Angular Docs. Right. But he he's like the wordsmith, like a poet. And so we played this Dr. Seuss poetry style with you though for angular anthems what i'm going to do is give you one angular specific word at a time and then you're going to come up with like a little jingle or a rap that would go with that word so right. if you're filling up for it let's let's get into oh this. man okay what's the word 
Okay. Your first one is actually, this is, well, I'm going to change it. I was going to do the same one I did with Dave, but I'm going to change it a little bit. We're going to go with module. 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 Mm -hmm. I need to think of a word that rhymes with module. Um, We can go uh, with. I have another one if we want to do another one. Right, give me another one and we'll come back to it. Okay, okay. Let's do component then. All right. When I see a component, it makes me chuckle because you need to decouple so anyone can own it. Nice. I don't know. That was pitchy. <laughs> no, it's much better than I can do. I can assure you of that. Oh my gosh. Okay. Love it. Then let's go with observable. All right. Make it servable. Use an observable. Push, not pull. Love, don't troll. <laughs> Love it. Oh, man. All right. You ready for module now or do you want me to do a totally new one? Do it, everyone. Okay. Uh, let's go with this will be our last one. Let's go right. with ser services. All right. Services make me nervous, but they're heaven sent when it comes to state management. <laughs> I don't know. That's uh, so humiliating. No. Now, or when do we start recording? We're totally recording. Oh, no. But yeah, that's uh, the thing uh, about uh, Zoom. The second you start, oh, the man. second you log into Zoom, it's recording. <laughs> All right, we'll just chop this out in post. Oh, no, it's staying. Oh, no. <laughs> I love it. No, you're so like you really are super talented and um, keep going. Like you're embarrassing me, but don't stop. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's it is true though. And one thing I I like the more I kind of think about it, the more I think it's true that like if people could come up with little musical jingles like this for Angular or any programming really, like think of how much people could learn from that. I think it'd be kind of a cool YouTube channel. You've got like the the angular jams. I've I've thought about that with Roger. Um, oh yeah. So one thing I will say, um, it's one of the the greatest learning mechanisms or devices is novelty. Mm -hmm. And so when you can introduce novelty into a learning process, just the way that we are wired, and I think because of just dopamine and the way that we respond to it, our brain suddenly becomes much more open to, to new information. And, yeah. um, I have an 11 year old son who was many, many years ago. I want to say he's maybe six or seven at the time we were doing spelling words. And mm -hmm. so it's like, spell this word and spell this word. And he just was having just like a really tough time, like just staying focused. He wasn't into it. And, um, so I just said like, stand up, and we're going to just kind of move our hands around and we're going to just, when we spell, we're going to sing. And so I don't remember what the words were, but let's say it was like matter, M-A-T-T-R. And it's like yeah. M-A-T-T-E-R. And I would go and, he, and all of a sudden he just started to get into it and, you know, cause C-A-U-S-E-E-E. -E -E. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like he just burned through the entire list. He learned yeah. it. And just by just moving around and just actually putting like a little melody as it was just a way for him to, to engage his brain. And um, it just really resonated. And I think this is why, even for me, if I'm doing something, a lot of times I kind of sing talk to myself yeah, because um, it's just engaging, I, I think a novel kind of a part of your brain that allows for these, these concepts to, to kind of sink in more. Yeah. So um Honestly, this is not the first time that I've actually sang to myself about <laughs> about Angular. So nice, uh, good fun. No, you're so right though. And on it, like from the teacher's perspective, I would love to have been in the classroom when your son took that test because I really <laughs> wonder if he sat there and like sang it out. <laughs> he probably did. Probably That's, did. It'd be awesome. Funny. <laughs> but, oh, okay. All Let's right. get into this. You've passed your challenge. Thank you for All sharing right. your skills. <laughs> I'm not voted but, off the island, so no, ready, no, uh, no voting. To get serious. Totally okay. We're gonna talk about learning Angular. Okay. And I do think though it's 
first of all, just fun. But secondly, I think it's helpful to understand your learning journey and what you experienced when you learned how to program. And we'll kind of break that down into smaller questions. But currently, let's let's kind of start, let everybody know where you're working now, where you've been, and then I'm going to have you explain your first experiences, like learning how to program. So right now, Lucas Rubelke, everybody, he's a principal engineer at Venmo. <laughs> uh, you've also worked at other companies, though, like Udacity and Web Filings and then Shutterfly. Mm-hmm. And you've written a book. So you're also an author. It's called Angular JS in Action. And then you've written multiple courses on Plural Site, on front end masters, AKED. A kid every everywhere almost all of them. So point is, you've been a teacher in multiple fashions, not just getting you know like like mentoring with people, mentoring juniors or whoever, but you've written courses, you've written physical books, you've been a teacher in multiple ways. Right. And again, that's why I feel like you're really a perfect person to have on this episode. Um, but you're also a very talented and skilled developer yourself. So what, you know, what was your first encounter with programming? Were you younger? Were you more like junior high or high school age? What was that like? So it's, it's kind of a, an interesting story and I'll try to condense it a bit. So this doesn't turn into a four hour (laughs) podcast or whatever, but, um, ever since I was a, a, a small kid, I think I, watch this old movie called sneakers. It's just like one of the first hacker movies I ever saw. And I'm like, that's what I want to do is electronics. <laughs> like, and so I graduated from high school. Like the next day I moved up to from Kansas. I moved up to Minnesota and I enrolled in this, you know, this pretty intense technical college. And, um, and I thought I was going to be like, you know, this hacker guy in the elevator, like wiring stuff. And in my yeah. mind, I had this completely fabricated and unrealistic, picture of what you know somebody who does low voltage electronics actually does and I was a an absolutely stunning mediocre student I was a straight B student like (laughs) I maintained a perfect 3.0 grade point average through college except one particular semester we were doing industrial electronics, which was a lot of programmable logic gate controllers. And I just lit up and I didn't know why I just like, it was super interesting. And I went, you know, I basically got straight A's like that semester. And I went right back to being a straight B student. (laughs) Um, I moved back to Wichita and everything around the, the economy in Wichita, Kansas is built around avionics. It's the air capital of the world. There's Boeing and all these companies. And so it's a real boomer bust, you know, kind of a cycle. And um, I got a job just fixing these components. And um, I just remember thinking like, I do not want to be here in 20 years. Right. Um, You know, there was these, these, you know, these guys, they're super nice, but they just like, they were living for the weekend. Like they kind of hit their ceiling and I'm like, I need to do something different. So I got into, um, I thought hardware was the thing. And so I went and like, I'm going to go pass some certifications. And I did that. And then the dot com crash happened. And I basically had the highest certification in Microsoft at the time, like Microsoft Mm -hmm. certified systems engineer plus internet or something. Um, And so people are like, wait a second, you have no experience, but you have this (laughs) super like heavy, like certification and it turned out to be a double-edged sword because nobody's like, we're not going to hire you based on your experience right? if you don't have any, but we're not going to hire you based on your certification because, you know, the minute you do get experience, like you're out. And so it just was a really tough thing. Yeah. And I ended up moving to Arizona and I discovered uh, Flash. And um, so I was going to a, a school here and I remember I discovered you know, flash and how to do animations. And I just kind of stopped going to school. Like all I wanted to do was just program and and make animations. And that's where uh, my first actual language was action script, which was also based on ECMAScript. So um, if you understand, or, you know, ES5, which is plain vanilla JavaScript, you know, for the most part, 
it's it's very similar. So it was essentially ES3. Um, they skipped ES4 for political reasons, and then they went to ES5. But um, even ActionScript 2 and 3, this is interesting, is very similar to TypeScript. And so this whole like cycle of having a language kind of evolve into more of a classical right. structured language is um, not something or it's not new to anybody who's came from from Flash. And um, and so this is where my experience to programming was um, was back in college. And I, it really just captured my imagination that I could think of a problem and I could I could express it and actually solve a problem. Um, and it wasn't until I essentially <clears throat> had, you know, really hit a, a, a real inflection point in my life where I'm like, what do I do with my life? Like, yeah. I'm not into hardware. Um, I don't actually enjoy working with physical hardware. Um, and so I'm like, maybe I'll try software. And it was, I remember um, being in the kind of the common area of the school and seeing something about Flash and I'm like, I'm going to just try this thing. And I did the simple animation and it was just like a beam of light came out <laughs> of the heavens. Nice. And I mean, I'm just like, yes. <laughs> and it just really progressed, um, you know, from there where I learned kind of how to program um, okay. in the Flash platform. And we don't really need to go into that, but it really, what I would say, even in my career is I've spent, I've been programming for about 20 years. And the first 10 years was um, just completely mediocre in the mm -hmm. sense of nobody knew who I was. Um, I just felt like I was wandering around in the wilderness. Like, what do okay. I do? What do I learn? Um, yeah. Maybe I should learn a classical language. So I went and signed up for a Java course at the community college. Then I'm like, I'm going to go past the certification. And so I became a Java certified programmer. It's that I'd never actually done java in right. my real life and so okay. i don't recommend doing that but um i for whatever reason i'm pretty good at memorizing large amounts of, of information and so okay. i'm pretty good at test but it was a lot of like guesswork and mistakes and um in very unstructured and mm -hmm. this is where i wasted a lot of time and then um, when i was at shutterfly i met um an individual um his name's stephen kensley who has turned out to be one of my absolute best mentors. Um, and we were very, still very close. He actually is the co-author of uh, Doctor in Action uh, for Manning. And I would say that's when I made that shift from thinking uh, or trying to be a programmer and actually trying to be like a craftsman and, mm. and really taking programming seriously as is an art and thinking about right. architecture and, and all these things, because when you're dealing with large scale systems, it's a lot different than just writing a little app that you put on your computer and you play around with. And, yeah. um, you know, from there it's, you know, it's been kind of this incremental thing where just, you know, I think getting better a little bit over time, yep. know, it adds up. So like, even the example is, you know, if I lost a pound a week, well, suddenly be like, Oh, you've lost a pound or in a month, you've lost four pounds. Well, over the course of a year, that actually adds up and it's somebody would lose 50 pounds and it's sustainable. Um, yeah. And so where, and I'll kind of bring this up just to hear where I'm at real quick, or at least up to the, the point of Angular is um, I saw kind of the writing on the wall with, with Flash. And I realized like, this is a technology that is going to be sunsetted. Right. And so I'm like, I need to learn JavaScript. Um, one, I'm going to just pause here for a second. I think this is important. I made the mistake of wrapping my identity into being like a flash developer. And so okay. even when you hear people say, oh, like, what do you do? Well, I'm an angular developer for the sake of a conversation. I kind of let that go. And I realized there's maybe not a better way to say that, but I really recommend people to not wrap their identity into a framework and not, I would go as far to say, not even a, a, like a language, I'm a JavaScript developer is, or a, I'm a front end developer is I think, you know, for me is I think everything, it all leads to creating product. Right. And so when flex and flash started to die, like I was devastated. I'm like, what am I now? Like, who right. am I? It was this yeah. real catcher in the rye kind of a moment. Like what, like, what am I? And I realized that I don't love 
flash. And as a result, I go build these cool animations. It's, yeah. I really love the cool animations and flash just happens to be, flash a cool is what gets I, had me to, I had to decouple my identity from that. And um, it was, a, I think probably one of the, the first like really big lessons I learned in my career is don't bake your identity into something you have no control over. Right. Um, and it certainly is, um, I think it really limits, it can really limit just, you know, how you see the world. And so um, that's when I kind of made the commitment to do a hard shift into um, JavaScript and uh, Angular JS at the time was the closest thing to how we were writing Flex at a large scale and it immediately resonated and um, I started writing a bunch of really bad blog posts. They were just <laughs> horrendous. And yeah. but this was before they were, it was popular. So, you know, Igor yeah. and Mishko and, and those folks, so they'd get on and be like, uh, this is pretty good, but this could be better. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, from there, AngularJS blew up and I just happened to be in, in the right place at the right time. So okay. um, I've brought you within at least six to seven years of cur present current time in terms nice. of my journey. So, okay. So a couple of questions come out of that. And one, it sounds like also that was where the idea of having a mentor started to become more meaningful to you, mm -hmm. where you had this mentor who really took you, helped you, trained you. It became very impactful to you. So I yes. want to like put a pin in that mm -hmm. and we'll come back to that idea. But sure, you did mention as you were learning, there were some things you were doing that were not effective Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you figured out some things that were more effective. And I'd like to dig into that a little bit more because I think it'll have some good relevance to what we're discussing as we continue on. But what did you find? What were you doing? Like, what did When you sat down to study, what did that look like? And what were those things that you found that, you know what, that, that ended up being a huge waste of my time? It was more effective right. to do this instead. Yeah. So, um, there's this guy, his name's Kay Anders Erickson, and he was the gentleman who was actually misquoted by Malcolm Gladwell on the 10,000 hour rule. Mm, um, and okay. so, but he's kind of the guy behind the 10,000 hour rule. Um, and he's like one of the four, you know, most authorities on skill acquisition. And um, he has this quote that I like a lot, and it's excellent demands effort and plan deliberate practice of increasing difficulty. And okay. Um, I'm trying to think about, you know, kind of the sequence of, of our conversation, because I don't want to like, you know, kind of jump way ahead <laughs> yeah. because, um, this really, when I, when I am working with an apprentice or I'm mentoring somebody, um, there's some very specific things that I have them do that comes from, you know, really me figuring out what works and what doesn't. And so programming is a very unique profession in that we can objectively validate whether or not somebody has a skill um, by the fact that they can create an observable artifact. So if somebody says, hey, do you know NGRX, for instance, you would say, absolutely, go look at my GitHub you know, profile and you can see you know, 12 applications in there that have NGRX. And unless somebody else has written this and I'm, and I'm you know, there's a larger, um, you know, kind of a confidence scheme going on, let's assume I'm being honest, then you can validate very quickly. You can look at my code and you can tell where I'm at as an engineer. Right. And so how do you know somebody is a good engineer or a good programmer? Well, you look at their code. Whereas in other professions, like let's say a doctor or a lawyer, well, how do you know they're a good doctor or a lawyer? It's, it's yeah. more subjective. It's like, well, they haven't lost a case. Well, maybe they're a horrible human being <laughs> and, you know, yeah. you know, you, you know, maybe they've made a pact with the devil and, you know, they, just because they haven't lost a case or, you know, well, they haven't killed anybody as, you know, in terms of doctors, well, that doesn't mean anything. Like, um, it's certainly not indicative of, of the quality of care, whereas with engineers that you can absolutely produce artifacts that demonstrate that you are absorbing and have acquired certain skill sets. Yeah. And so, um, when you are, especially with programming and I'll, and I'll just kind of flat out, just say kind of the, the, the general shape of when I'm working with somebody or even how I approach skill acquisition is 
you have to be back to this quote is it defi- it, it absolutely demands intentional deliberate practice and you have to be very intentional about what the outcome is. So right. how do you know, like, how does somebody know that they know Angular? Well, you would have to, in your, you would have to come up with some criteria of success of, well, I'm going to write an Angular app or I'm going to write 10 Angular applications and, or how do I know NGRX? Well, I'm going to create 10 apps with this. And so when I'm working with an apprentice, is we do basically a 30 by 30, which is I have them write 30 Angular apps in 30 days. And they're broken up into 10 sets or three sets of 10. And so every kind of segment or cycle is focuses on kind of a core set of um, objectives. So the first one just being uh, really components and services communicating with the REST API and doing some basic layouts with uh, master detail view, which is really the atomic building block of really any application is so by master detail view, what I mean is you have a, a master list of objects from a collection, and then you can select one and you can see like the details for that, and then you can modify it. So when you build a like the quintessential hello world, like, you know, application for JavaScript frameworks is a to do list. Well, a to-do list is a master detail view. You have a master list of to-do items that you can either create, read, update, or delete. And so I have a student essentially commit to building 30 apps in 30 days. The first 10 being really component-driven architecture, you know, service, you know, services and communicating with the REST API. The next 10 deals with state management and Mm -hmm. reactive, um, turning your Angular apps reactive. And then the next 10, the last set is having them think of some idea or some problem that they want to solve and then expressing what they've learned in the previous 20 apps in some unique and novel way. So what happens is a lot of people will do like kind of these YouTube clones or um, whatever. Just think of some problem and then solve it. And it, it can, and however you want to do it, but it's kind of challenging them to really start to express themselves and think of programming as, as kind of a vocabulary yeah. and, and starting to create these, these expressions. And um, what this does is over the course of 30 days that there's every day they submit the app and they get feedback from a mentor. And so I'm not always the one doing it. Um, right. In fact, if you are, if you went through it, then the next step is that you actually mentor somebody else through that cycle. Okay. And what this does is every day you're getting feedback. So the one caveat I would say on the K. Anders Erickson quote is in the deliberate practice of increasing difficulty with high quality feedback loops is that you have to be able to, to get feedback in almost real time. And so you submit an application, you get feedback, you move on to the next one and it's slightly more difficult. And so one is it reinforces some behavior patterns and it starts to build muscle memory. But by the end of it, you now have 30 apps in your GitHub repo. Um, at some point I ask that they start deploying them out to like for sell or something so that you know they're actually deployed. And I have found that people that participate in this exercise, like they have no problem like whatsoever getting a job. Like there are so many companies that are looking for just solid Angular developers that basically can build reactive, you know, properly state managed Angular applications that can communicate um, with a REST or a GraphQL API um, that they've had, you know, really there's more opportunity than there are people that actually know how to do this. Right. And um, as well as at some point they start working in like unit testing and um, end to end testing with Cypress and, um, and the different things. And so that's, how I, like if I'm doing something, so that is kind of the formalized framework that I I have, um, you know, people go through. But the reason why I bring that up now is because 30 by 30 is arbitrary, is you have some output over some time domain. Right. And so what I do a lot of times for myself is I might do like, like a 10 by 10, because maybe I'm trying to learn something that doesn't require me or it doesn't take 30 days for me to, to wrap my mind around it, or I'll, I'll even do a 10 by five or 10 by two is that, but it's okay. more so is I'm going to create 
this number of things over this time domain, and I'm going to get the appropriate feedback as I go through it. And that's, for me, everything that I've learned about skill acquisition comes down to having very intentional, mm -hmm. you know, clearly defined outcomes with the appropriate feedback loops and the resources available to complete it. And um, so that was a lot of information very quickly. <laughs> oh. I, don't, I don't even know if I took a, a breath for like five minutes, <laughs> but um, I think anything other than that, um, like if you're, if you're participating in an activity and it's not yielding some outcome or mm -hmm. something that you can actually, that somebody else can observe, then I would just challenge you to one question, whether or not it's effective, valuable, or can you reframe it to provide something that's going to provide value in the future by right. having, for instance, a, a repository. It's amazing to me how many people, you know, they want to learn how to program or they they're learning how to program. And when I ask, like, well, let me see your, the code you've written. It's it's very sparse, if it, if at any. And the single greatest thing somebody can do is if you want to program, like program, like write code. If you want yeah, to play music, yeah. you want to learn the piano, like watching YouTube videos on how to do chord progressions, like that's not going to help. What you have to do yeah. eventually is sit down at the keyboard and just play a lot. Yeah. And that's where I think new programmers, especially, it can be very uncomfortable to kind of launch out into to the wilderness and and just code yeah but science you know in you know science would actually you know certainly you know is validated that it's just this you know controlled and repetitious um exposure you know to certain stimuli is ultimately how you start to you know to make sense of it and, and eventually mm -hmm. you know observations turns into skills uh, which turns into mastery I, I literally had to pull out a pencil and write a lot of these things out because you, <laughs> you, you mentioned some things and like my teacher brain just went wing, like got really excited. So what I like about what you're saying, cause, cause I asked like, what is it, you know, what does learning look like for you? And what, right. what I get out of that is that you break things down into what in the education world we would call learning objectives. Right. Right. You've given yourself an objective and it's a specific targeted objective with an outcome. So you, you use some really important words there because I, I think that's exactly what's missing from a lot of people's learning. And even from the teacher's perspective, when they give students something to learn, they right. don't have those objectives. It's sort of like, well, here's an article, go read it. Okay, right. but what's the objective? Yes, yep. of course, learning that topic is an objective, but what do I go do with it? There needs to be an actionable right. result with that. So How do you measure it? Exactly. It's, it's, you have to quantify it. Yeah, yeah. So super important what you're hitting on there. The second thing, though, is you're you're mentioning getting that feedback. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck because you come into an industry, you're brand new to it, whether you're a career changer or just you know, coming out of high school or boot camp or something mm -hmm. or, or college. And I think being in an unfamiliar territory can be scary. It can be overwhelming. Right. Yep. You don't know people and it's just hard to find that mentor. And so that's where, you know, if, if companies or individuals like you, who've really gone out of your way to find mentees and train them, right. but I think it's so critical for our industry to do that because so many people come in and they leave or they come in and they produce lower quality code because they just haven't had that proper proper mentorship of somebody right. looking at their code and really breaking it down and saying, yes, but here's how we can improve on it or right. no, that doesn't work at all. So yeah. having that mentor is really important. Another thing you said, though, was exactly what you mentioned at the beginning of breaking things down. Yes, right. Exactly. And and that's what I love about this 30 and 30 is that you are taking application, like, you know, application size projects, but you've broken it down into 30 different mm -hmm. sizes so that we can like, you know, break it down piece by piece and, and then really narrow in on a specific learning objective. Yeah, so It's all really, really critical. I, I think 
the formula you have, honestly, I think you should like publish it in some way because if if more people could be using something like that, I think our industry would just like triple. I mean, we we would have such a strong uh, junior developer force coming in out of yeah. college or out of boot camp or wherever they're learning. I just think it's it's really well thought out and really well done. So let, um, me, let me just share kind of yeah. my, I'll just for public record, I'll just share kind of where my heart is and, okay. and what I think my legacy will be. Um, I, I believe we're going to just kind of step out for a second, then I'll come back into where I was going with this is that okay. I, I think software engineering is one of the greatest industries in the world. And I don't know of very many industries where you can, with predictable and replicable results, take somebody without any, take somebody or go enter into the industry and have a reasonable expectation to make six, six figures at some point. Yeah. And not only to do that, but to be able to do it without incurring student loan debt. And the reason why I know that you can do this is because I have personally mentored over 20 individuals from zero to one to where they have no, no experience, but they have all the personality markers and now they're engineers. Um, my latest apprentice, um, he just got hired by Starbucks and his starting wage was like significantly higher than what he was making as a manager in, in a retail space. And this has such a huge impact, not only on him, but his family. And so when you start thinking about orders of complexity is I care deeply about the people I work directly with, but ultimately I care about their families and their partners. Yeah. And really what I care about is their children is because I believe that what we need is a society, you know, some people would say, well, we need this redistribution of, of income. And I think what ultimately what we need is, is really a redistribution of just opportunity. And I think that's what people really want is just the opportunity to do more and to be more and to have more. And I believe that software engineering at a, at a large, you know, at a worldwide, you know, kind of a socioeconomic kind of a, a thing is a mechanism is one of the greatest ways to offset a lot of problems that we see is a society. And, and again, you can do this without student loan debt. And so right. for me, my legacy, I believe is to, to help shepherd and create resources to allow people who have all the right personality markers to be an engineer that wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to break into the industry and, and help them bridge that gap. But what that does is that creates real systemic change and generational changes for them and their families and everything, you know, is improved that let's just take even like, you know, you know, Igor and, and Mishko, like, I don't think they had any idea that when they created Angular JS and Angular, that people would make millions and millions of yeah. dollars off of that framework. Right. But it has, it's, it's actually changed my life in the most profound way. And I would encourage everybody to think about not limit or undervalue the impact that what we're doing as engineers actually has on the world as a whole. And so this is kind of my broad, you know, like when I think about engineering is I think it, I think it has the opportunity to really make an impact social from a social logical standpoint. Um, and so with that said is everything that I've talked about, I'm pretty open and upfront about it because at some point my intention is to actually open source the entire framework, like all of okay. the resources, the documentation, and just say, here it is. And anybody that wants to take this and run with it, they can run their own mentorship programs. And I've actually talked to people at like churches and, and different things where okay. I've, I've like, here's my playbook. And you know, because somebody maybe goes to a church and, you know, they're involved with like, like a young man's ministry or something, whatever, and they know how to program and they're looking for a way of like, well, how do I help these other individuals like program more or faster? And so, you know, my goal is to take everything I know, everything even I've talked about and to formalize it into 
you know, a set of artifacts that I can then open source or make available to anybody in the world to nice. go and train engineers. And um, the feedback I've gotten from this is, has been pretty phenomenal. So the answer is yes, I should write a book or I should create some artifacts um, <laughs> that is, um, you know, certainly kind of in the works. And so anybody who's listening to this, feel free to hold me accountable and be <laughs> like, so when are we going to see this, you know, this, these, these models available? Yeah. Um, I think the one thing I will say is because I am drawing heavily on, you know, pedagogical, like learning, you know, like modalities and like everything I'm saying, anybody who's, you know, been in traditional education, like I'm going to use a lot of words that have, they've heard. And so in some ways it's so simple that I kind of trick myself sometimes to think and it's, it's just not very remarkable. Like when you say it's, it's a 30 by 30. And so for me, it's just like, sit down and write 30 apps in 30 days. But when I tell people this, they're just like, oh my gosh, and the lights go on. And so yep. that is, I think that's maybe a, a, a flaw and maybe an insecurity of my, for myself is that um, I think I trick myself into thinking that it's, it's unremarkable because it's so simple. Um, but I think, I guess the results possibly would, um, say otherwise. So, uh, all right, holding myself accountable, I will <laughs> make this available to the public in 2023, certainly Please. not in 2022, but 2023, it's going to happen. I think every, every individual who's attempting to learn angular or who's gone through that process would say, it's not simple what you've, what you've created. And I would think that everybody's cheering for you to to make that happen because it, it is a problem. And then, you know, this is exactly what Joe Eames was wanting to do with mm -hmm. Thinkster yeah. was that there is a problem with how we're training people and just making a bunch of courses and having people passively watch you as you build an app and explain how to right. build it. That is not effective right. teaching. It's not effective learning. It's, it's part of learning and it can be, it can be effective in ways, but that's not going to be, something that will effectively make a successful developer. And we need, we need, we need these more robust and thought out right. uh, processes. And absolutely. I think there's, there's something to be said for what you're doing there. Again, this is exactly why I wanted you on. this episode. Ah, Well, uh, nice to see that I'm earning my lunch money. <laughs> Definitely. Mm -hmm.